Welcome to the D List, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. I know I took a break from doing one of those things for a while, but the other one remained true the whole time. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about Phineas and Ferb again. Back in 2015, I talked about how much I love Phineas and Ferb, particularly the way it uses a seemingly repetitive formulaic structure to build a larger, cohesive world filled with rich characters. And back in 2016, I counted down my favorite episodes of Phineas and Ferb, making a point of saying, I'm only including 11 and 22 minute episodes of the show. I won't be including the movie, the hour-long specials, or the two-parter Where's Perry, but they're all really fantastic and would probably steal all the top spots if I was including them. But I did always intend on doing a follow-up list ranking the special episodes someday. And then I did a Q&A video just this past Easter where I opened the floodgates to questions from you, and I got a question from Chandler from Theme Park Backlot who asked me, Hey Dave, what's your favorite of the hour-long Phineas and Ferb specials? And Chandler's question prompted me to bump up my plans for ranking the specials from someday to right now. So here's my rankings of Phineas and Ferb's extended length adventures so far. Number 11, The Alka Files. Perry is training several new recruits, including Doof, but he's frustrated when his team isn't exactly up to his level yet. Meanwhile, evil scientist Paul Rubens takes over Alka with robotic fleas, and the J.K. Simmons, Josh Gad, and Steven Rootbugs from Doof 101 attempt to become agents. And much like Doof 101, this has all the makings of a backdoor pilot with its own pretty rockin' theme song. The if there ever was a plan to make this a full series, I assume the three bugs would be the regular B story, since at one point early in Phineas and Ferb's development, they were going to be the regular C story. What were the characters that you took away uh, from that original pitch? They were three bugs. Obviously. <laughs> that uh, we all I, I mean, that. we were big fans of Rocky and Bullwinkle, and one of the things we thought of was having not only the Perry and, and Doofenshmirtz story, <laughs> but then at certain points cutting away to these bugs. Mm -hmm. That lived in the same world and were also affected by the different And the only oh ones class. who were kind of well, aware that it was a show. I'm, I'm glad we cut it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we cut it just to, to lessen the level. In, a, in 11 minutes, what we needed <laughs> yeah. was to service another storyline yeah. in our yeah. show. Four or five is good. The episode centers on Perry once again having to learn teamwork, but last time he did that, he was learning to work with somebody competent. Now he has to learn to lead a team who doesn't quite have it together yet but the team learns to use each of their strengths to work together to save the day. The episode's full of the usual callbacks. All we need is a big rubber band and two palm trees to launch us. You watch way too much TV, Wendell. Oh, just the one show. And wacky gags, some of which are pretty dark. Tell my wife I love her. And I honestly wouldn't mind seeing Perry's Alka team fight evil together again in the future. Number 10. Phineas and Ferb save Summer. The special begins with a musical sequence so ambitious that all the recycled animation it uses is completely understandable. Then the plot begins in earnest as two rivals have their events right next to each other. Love Muffin registered as Hatfield and Alka registered as Capulet, which is just one notch more clever than necessary and I love it. In the aftermath of the brawl, Monogram gets fired from his post by Jay Leno and he doesn't even get the dignity of a TBS pickup. Then Doof moves the Earth away from the sun, risking the loss of summer forever, and nobody knows what to do about it. And I will do everything in my power to recommend you wear a cardigan or light sweater. But all my sweaters are ugly and Christmas themed! Well then, just wear warmer clothes. Oh great, even fictional politicians refuse to act on climate change. Phineas and Ferb try to move the Earth back into place, but it's no easy task. Meanwhile, Love Muffin goes full West Side Story on Alka, leading even Monty to get involved in the fight. And Candace tries to get over her fear of spiders, which is only made worse when one hospitalizes Stacy. That's... dark. There's quite a few fun beats in this one. Monty Monogram is a character who doesn't get all that much screen time, so it's nice to see him fulfill his dream of following in his father's footsteps and fighting evil with Alka. I've got to warn Carl. Okay, tell me you didn't hear that. Build the building settling. So our building has a sudden urge to warn Carl. And Doof and Rodney's rivalry is always a delight to watch. You sounded like a bashful Santa Claus pitching softballs to a girl in a bikini. All right, number four. You don't know what that sounds like. Wallace Shawn has a fun guest role as a clueless spelunking instructor. Now we're going to squeeze past this stalactite. I mean, stalagmite. Wait, which one is on top? Actually, I believe that's just a hole. Oh, I seem to be trapped. 
turn away, folks. I'm gonna have to saw my arm off. And I never get tired of seeing the current whereabouts of the building from Doof's side of the moon. This might have some of the biggest stakes of any Phineas and Ferb episode. Usually it's just the Tri-State area on the line, not the entire planet. So compared to that, Candace's stakes seem pretty small, even if they are intensely personal. But they have to be overcome in order to help with the big stakes. And Phineas means well, but he's not great at being supportive to somebody going through something. He's being silly. Heck, I don't even remember what I was afraid of. Spiders. <laughs> Candace, you forgot the box. Yeah, subtle nuance is not Phineas' strength, is it? Although I guess he's better at it than Buford. Buford! I think there must be something wrong with this program. Number nine. Last day of summer. In the series finale, sort of, it's the last day of summer and Candace fails at her last chance to bust the boys. But when she activates Doof's do overinator, she and Doof end up in an endless loop. It's almost like the show is saying, oh yeah, you haters accused the formula of being repetitive before, yeah, you ain't seen nothing yet. But soon the loop threatens to rip apart the space-time continuum and already starts erasing things from existence, including Phineas and Ferb themselves. Phineas and Ferb are gone! I'm sure it's going to be alright, dear, but who are Phineas and Ferb? <laughs> Wow, Crazy Out sucked up that groundhog, huh? The what? Oh, please. Why would a story about characters living the same day over and over involve groundhogs? Meanwhile, Vanessa tries to tell Doof she wants to move out, and he uses the looping day to try to become less of a loser, all while ignoring what she really wants from him. This is one last big adventure for the gang, at least for the moment, so it focuses on the characters who have always been the real protagonists of the series, Candace and Doof. Phineas and the kids got their big finale with Hack Your Age. And it's really nice to go out on a note of these two working so hard to save their families, even if their methods are a little misguided. I love any time Candace works with her brothers, and any time Doof works with Perry, so I'm glad this is the note they chose to send the series off. And while this episode closes the door for this particular summer, it does set things up for the future, such as Doof's turn to the good side. I hear Alka's looking for a few good animals. You know, until his relapses at Halloween and New Year's and Christmas, of course. But what makes this episode work as a finale so well is the final musical number, where the fourth wall is completely down and the gang reminisces about all of their adventures, and they thank us for joining them. Because it's been a great summer and we thank you for coming along. Thank you for coming along. Number 8. Mission Marvel. Aunt May! Phineas and Ferb are making a crossover. Doof's power drainanator bounces off Phineas and Ferb's space station and hits the Avengers, draining them of their powers. I guess this is after Banner turned into the Hulk one too many times and was unable to turn back, just like he appeared in Ragnarok. So he's still the Hulk, just not strong. So while Hydra uses Doof to get to the heroes, the Avengers team up with Phineas and Ferb, and S.H.I.E.L.D. teams up with Alka to set things right. This was the first big project announced after Disney bought Marvel, and it mostly draws from the Marvel animated television universe, using its cast, including Chi McBride, as Nick Fury. I'm going to proceed as if this were going really well. But it draws a little from the Marvel Cinematic Universe as well, featuring a few visual homages to the Avengers, since... That was the biggest movie they had to go off of at the time. But it does sort of inadvertently predict several future MCU moments. You know, Stark Industries offers summer internships. Thanks, but this summer's pretty packed. So give me the hammer. What do I do? I just stick out my hand, right? Come on, baby. Come to papa. That is not how it works. What do you mean? I've got your powers. Wielding Mjolnir is about worthiness, not power. <laughs> You think that was Howard the Duck? Time is of the essence. We've got a... No, it wasn't Howard the Duck. What? I'm just saying. He did have a bill. And it predicted several conversations we're still having about Marvel Media. None of the women superheroes showed up, so it's all about testosterone and towers and fighting. All I ever do is quips. Like this one, for instance. And the one preceding it. Can we please not kill the gravitas of this moment? Sorry. There's plenty of references sprinkled throughout to all sorts of Marvel media. I've always told her, don't ever make Phineas angry. You wouldn't like him when he's angry. <sighs> Is your head gonna burst into flames or am I thinking of somebody else? And a few references to things that aren't Marvel but are still fun references. Oh, the rustic exterior is a facade. Wait till you see the inside. Oh, man. You guys are good. Just a little British sci-fi technology. Out of the world! Ah! 
As a Marvel comedy special, it's a lot of fun, and it's worth watching just for the brilliant casting choice of Danny Trejo as Venom. Was he bitten by a radioactive platypus? And as a Phineas and Ferb special, it's pretty good. It's a nice sequel to The Beak, now with real superheroes involved. It's a little controversial for being the meanest we ever see Phineas be to Candace, which... Yeah, it's a little unsettling. And I get it, the stakes are high here, and she did mess several things up, but come on, dude. It's partly on you for not giving her better instructions. That said, considering how often Candace gets annoyed with Phineas, even when he's completely oblivious to her annoyance, it is an interesting exploration of a role reversal, and it does nicely set up a very sweet reconciliation at the end. Isabella's arc also seems a little underserved, like it doesn't really set up that she's feeling this way until she's about to sing a song about feeling this way, but at least her underserved arc is used to address the underserving of the MCU's non-male heroes. But Buford and Baljeet get a few nice moments together as we finally hear Buford admit what we've known for a long time. I worry about you, you know, because you're my best friend. God, I'd hate to see how you treat your enemies. Hey, if Marvel characters have always existed in this world, has Buford been wearing a Punisher shirt this whole time? Number 7. Phineas and Ferb's Christmas Vacation In one of just a handful of episodes set well after the summer, Phineas and Ferb want to thank Santa for everything he's done for them. Meanwhile, Candace is trying to figure out what Jeremy wants for Christmas, and Doof wants a reason to hate Christmas to justify using his Naughtyinator to stop Santa from coming. This is a charming Christmas special that pays tribute to other classic Christmas specials. Doof's basically trying to one-up the Grinch by preventing Christmas altogether instead of stealing it in the act. And all it takes to push him to do this are some annoying carolers. What sort of plan is that anyway? Let's go to a stranger's house and in song form refuse to leave unless he hands over a food dish no one's prepared since the 16th century. Hey, as far as unreasonable demands in Christmas carols go, you're getting off easy. If the person who you sing to can't provide the wassail, you are entitled to his debit card and pin number. <laughs> of course, Doof's not alone in finding these carolers annoying. They also find each other annoying. Let's do... But it's Christmas, Becky! You gotta get over me, Josh. If there's one criticism I could make, Candace's story is resolved a little too easily. We can skip this one! I already got him what he really wanted! Yes! I guess this whole thing was pretty easily resolved. But you know what? After all the wild coincidences that have made life miserable for Candace over the years, I think she's earned one that makes life convenient for her. Besides, it all sets up the obligatory Christmas special Gift of the Magi scene. Wait, Santa, it's true, isn't it? You planned everything so everyone's Christmas wish would come true. Yeah, Santa was behind almost every moment of this episode, all setting it up perfectly so that everyone would get their Christmas wish. From Phineas's wish to be like Santa, to Doof's wish to find a reason to hate Christmas. I mean, Santa even got Doof the Naughtyinator and then destroyed the Naughtyinator just so everything would go according to plan. Santa carefully orchestrated everything from the top, like a benevolent chess master leaving no room for free will, or at least knowing you well enough to know exactly what you will do with your free will. It's a very Calvinist take on Santa. But what do you expect from a show beloved for its intricate comedy plotting? This one's not as long as the later specials, clocking in at somewhere between 33 and 36 minutes depending on which version you're watching. Yeah, there are a couple of different cuts available of this episode, with differences including an entire musical number. Does he want DVD or some video games? Does he want maybe one of those new digital frames? But the differences between cuts aren't really make or break for me. The DVD release has a shorter version, but it makes up for it with great bonus features, including a look at the show's songwriting process. This melody's getting so higher, I'm developing vocal notes. Yeah, I'm putting that down higher. in invisible ink for you. Thanks, Wait. I appreciate it. Oh, and if you can, track down the Toys R Us DVD release, which came with an exclusive bonus disc that featured Chronicles of Meep commentaries. Very hard to find, but absolutely worth it. Number six. Night of the Living Pharmacists. Doof has accidentally caused an outbreak of zombies that look like him, and it's up to Phineas and Ferb to stop this invasion. All while Candace tries to learn to be cool from Vanessa's friends, and Isabella tries to confess her crush on Phineas to earn her emotional bravery patch. This Halloween special starts things off with an absolutely perfect credit sequence that evokes Saul Bass and Bernard Herrmann. Man, I love that. And it has some genuinely unsettling sequences, like the doof zombie versions of the Alka agents. But of course, it's mostly just really funny jokes. There's no internet! I've got to know what's going on! Yeah! Pinch is back, baby! Wait, this is all stuff that happened yesterday. Ha! 
I love that Deuce disaster here is extra embarrassing because his daughter's having a sleepover. And I really love any chance to develop the friendship between Candace and Vanessa. It is kind of a shame that Stacy doesn't get involved in the main plot, but her cutaways are great. And this zombie movie parody gets the best seal of approval imaginable by featuring a cameo from the inventor of the zombie movie, George A. Romero, as a reporter with the puntastic name Don Adedead. Don? Thanks, Gordon. I'm standing here in downtown Danville. It's an unbelievable scene. This episode makes history by inviting Sean and Ed to join the likes of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and the cast of Oh Brother Where Art Thou as characters who are technically both Disney characters and Universal characters. I mean, you can't just grow a lab coat. I don't know, perhaps the disease infects your clothing as well. But most importantly, this episode makes history as the first time Phineas and Ferb team up with Doof. You know, without having their memories erased. Water should change everyone back. Um, isn't that a bit of a leap? No, I'm a scientist. I'm gonna go with him on that. Although Phineas and Isabella do lose the memory of her actually earning her patch, so is she just gonna feel unsatisfied about that, or what? Number five, Milo Murphy's Law, the Phineas and Ferb effect. That's right, it counts, I'm including it. In the season two premiere of Milo Murphy's Law, the Pistachions have just about taken over Danville. So Milo, Orton, Dakota, and Cavendish find the future Professor Time, or as he's known today, Heinz Doofenshmirtz. And Zack and Melissa get trapped with Balji, Buford, and Candace until they're rescued by Phineas and Ferb. This episode addresses Phineas and Ferb's ridiculously good luck and pairs it with Milo Murphy's scientifically terrible luck to great effect. Well, what do you usually do when things go wrong? We have no frame of reference for that. This juggles the two masters of being a Phineas and Ferb reunion and being the resolution to a Milo Murphy's Law cliffhanger, and it handles both of these tasks admirably. Granted, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense as just a Phineas and Ferb reunion. You really have to have been watching season one of Milo Murphy's Law for this to make any sense. But if you're already watching Milo and you miss Phineas, it's satisfying on both counts. As a Milo fan, the emotional payoff of Dakota and Cavendish's relationship is beautiful. As a Weird Al fan, it's nice to see him in another Bruno Mars parody video. As a Fly to the Concords fan, it's nice hearing noted Bowie impersonator Jermaine Clement sing a song about pressure. It's just a lot of pressure. That's not necessarily inner city related. And as a fan of wacky time travel shenanigans that don't quite make sense, boy does this ever deliver. Wait a minute, why am I still part plant? And as a Phineas and Ferb fan, it's just really nice seeing everybody in action again and knowing they're still out there making the most of every day. I think the simpler thing would be to ditch the kid who makes bad things happen. No, Candace, we need all the soldiers we can get. Oh, sure, Phineas. Where was that attitude during Mission Marvel? Number four. Phineas and Ferb, Star Wars. It's summer in a galaxy far, far away. Darth and Schmertz wants credit for designing the Death Star and to amass some force to power his Sithinator. Stormtrooper Candace wants to be promoted to battle instead of running errands for Darth Vader. And Phineas and Ferb don't want to leave Tatooine. Of course the summer lovers love living on the sunniest planet in the galaxy. But when the Death Star plans fall into their possession, they have to follow R2-D2 across the galaxy. It's a deceptively risky proposition parodying Star Wars. It's already the most parodied thing out there. How many more jokes are there left to make about Star Wars? Ah, but if there's one thing we know this show excels at, it's finding brand new jokes in a well-worn formula. This isn't even the first project to give Star Wars the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead treatment. It's been done by fan films and official Lucasfilm projects alike. But man, what a great fit for this special. So much of the show's humor is already based on near misses between the various plot lines, so near misses between the Danville characters and the Star Wars scenes is a delightful add-on. And you want to talk finding new Star Wars jokes? I have seen a lot of Star Wars parodies in my day, but I don't think I've ever seen a visual gag made from the title crawl itself. But of course this special takes just about every opportunity for a joke. In fact, I can only really think of one missed opportunity. Too short for a stormtrooper? Yes. Yes, I am. This special accomplishes a high-wire balancing act by tying in iconic moments from the original film, plus iconography and gags from the other films, all with a cohesive narrative with character arcs and emotional stakes. The Phineas and Ferb characters fit pretty naturally into this take on the Star Wars galaxy, and there are fun cameos from the likes of Simon Pegg, Ross Marquand, and the Mythbusters. Plus, the special goes a little deeper into the moral philosophy of Star Wars than most Star Wars media, let alone most Star Wars parodies, touching on the innocent human lives who get brainwashed by propaganda into serving the Empire. 
It's a great Star Wars parody and a great Phineas and Ferb alternate universe story. Ah, so long, Perry the Platypus. Now I can live to fight in the sequel. Yeah, when are we getting the Darth and Schmurt Strikes Back? And will the Milo Murphy's Law gang be living on Cloud City? Look, Disney Plus isn't gonna overstuff itself with content. Number three. Phineas and Ferb the movie, Across the Second Dimension. Phineas and Ferb are now starring in a Disney Channel original movie, and all it takes to set the movie off is converging the A and B plots as the inciting incident instead of the resolution. When they help Doof fix his other Dimensionator, they find a dimension where an eviler Doof has already taken over the Tri-State area. Perry, meanwhile, is desperate to keep his secret life from the boys so he won't have to be relocated, but the only thing more important to him than staying with the boys is keeping them safe. Phineas feels betrayed when he learns the truth about Perry, but they have to work together to find their way back to their own dimension. Candace, meanwhile, finds herself eager to grow up, until she meets a version of herself who had to grow up too early, and it gets a little heavy for an animated decom, and I really, really love it. The movie strikes the perfect balance of being accessible to a first-time viewer, but rewarding for fans who have seen every episode. Peppered throughout the movie are both explicit callbacks and more subtle bits of world-building, like the fact that the Resistance layer under Isabella's house is converted from Pinky's hideout. And it's a nice treat to actually get to see the dimensions that the baby alien, the giant floating baby head, and Candace's hallucinatory zebra come from. Man, this sequence must have been so much fun to board. And of course, there are some fun references to the world outside of the show, too. Get me! I'm a George O'Keefe painting! Well, why don't you ask it, Kierkegaard? What? Existentialist trading cards. They came with the gum. But even with all the callbacks, the broad story beats, and the characters are explained clearly enough that you understand all the stakes, even if you haven't spent the past two seasons with these characters. But if you do know the show well, man, that climax is really satisfying. And for me, the most satisfying beat of all is Candace knowing how to use her own bad luck to save the day. I'm gonna bust my brothers to my mom, and I'm gonna fail! See, if only she remembered later that weaponizing bad luck was an option, she probably would have been a lot nicer to Milo. And yeah, because the series wasn't ending yet, everything had to go back to normal, so the characters had to forget about the most exciting thing that ever happened to them. But they managed to do that in a meaningful and emotional way. And it's nice that the show later gave us a follow-up with the characters who didn't forget about this adventure. At the start of the series, one of the core running gags was how Phineas and Ferb's plot and Perry the Platypus's plot don't have anything to do with each other until they intersect at the end. So it's really nice knowing that all this time, Perry was paying attention and he really did care. So even though Phineas and Ferb don't remember, it's nice that Perry will never forget the best day of his life. The day that he finally got to team up with his best friends. And the movie features some of the catchiest songs from the entire run of the series. And you know what a high bar that is to clear. Even the deleted song is one of the catchiest ever written. Oh, and don't forget about the Slash music video. Unless you're watching one of the cuts that doesn't have the Slash music video at the end, in which case, I'm sorry. Number two. Where's Perry? Parts 1 and 2. When the Flynn Fletcher family and friends go to Africa, Perry has to fake sickness to stay home and thwart Doof's plot. But it turns out Doof's plot was just a decoy to get Perry out of the way. Which he wouldn't have had to deal with Perry anyway if he hadn't acted suspicious causing Monogram to make him cancel his trip. He could have just gone on with his plan without Perry interrupting, but eh, at least this way he got to ruin Perry's day while getting rid of him early. Then Doof attempts his real plan, hitting Monogram with an evilinator so that Monogram would hand Alka over to him. Really presumptuous of Duke to assume that just becoming evil would be enough to get Monogram to join him. I mean, has he learned nothing from his relationship with Rodney? But when the Innator hits Carl instead, unleashing all of his built-up resentment towards Alka, nothing goes according to plan. Meanwhile, Candace is nervous about why Jeremy wants to talk to her and why she hasn't heard from him yet, as she continues to be one of television's best depictions of anxiety. 
I mean, there's a good reason why he didn't show up. And he probably wants to tell me he wants us to start wearing matching sweaters or something cute like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's him! Jeremy, hello! This episode possibly could have worked as a 44 minute instead of two 22 minutes, but they make the most of the two-parter by giving everybody a major cliffhanger. Some characters' cliffhangers are resolved more swiftly than others. Carl gets so few episodes to shine, so it's great to see him get major character development and a big rockin' musical number. And if yeah, I'm evil, I'm evil for extra credit. And Doof and Monogram get so few chances to be a duo, and it's always nice to hear Dan and Swampy razz each other. As these characters or as these characters, it's always hilarious. He's not officially an employee. He's unpaid. You don't pay him? He gets college credit. Are you sure you're not evil? Oh, hey, you heard it here first. Doofenshmirtz is an ally to the young working class. This is a great episode for fan service, not only bringing back the robots from I Was a Middle-Aged Robot, but providing some of the best moments of Alka action, what with Perry recruiting the population of a continent and Francis himself joining the fight. We're surrounded by parts. And it's also a great episode for emotional beats, making the most of our investment in the love between Perry and the kids, Candace and Jeremy, and even Francis and Carl. Really, I'm just a sucker for any time Perry shows how much he truly loves Phineas and Ferb. And my number one favorite Phineas and Ferb special, Summer Belongs to You. We're just about 100 episodes into the summer, and we're only just now getting to the summer solstice. And in an effort to make the longest day of summer even longer, Phineas Flynn finally goes full Phileas Fogg by chasing the sun around the world in a day. But Buford makes it personal by betting him that if he doesn't do it, he has to spend the rest of the summer doing nothing. Meanwhile, Candace is nervous about her relationship status with Jeremy, and Vanessa's upset that Doof is spending their vacation together on work. As the first of the actual hour-long specials, not counting the almost hour-long Christmas special, this does a lot of the heavy lifting for solidifying the expansion of the world of the show. Introducing elements like the name of Perry's organization, the OWCA, the organization without a cool acronym, and even running gags like the Klimpaloon. It also showed that these characters could sustain a longer story, and the writer's knack for silly setups leading to satisfying payoffs doesn't need to be limited to quick cartoon gags. Although they're still very, very good at quick cartoon gags. Welcome to the 27th Annual Substitute Teacher Day. We begin by... All right, who's the wise guy? The length also allows for more breathing room for character development. We get another peek at Buford's hidden depths that would be explored further later. Full tear, Buford! Really? Oh, I can't help it. Paris does it to me every time. We get another look at Vanessa's conflicted relationship with her father and the maybe unfortunate ways she starts to take after him. Vanessa, you rented a scooter. Uh, yeah. Rented. And we follow up on her dynamic with Ferb from Vanessary Roughness. We start to get real with Candace and Jeremy's relationship. And man, Isabella's song is heartbreaking. Oh, how can he not feel the same way? In fact, all the songs in this one are great. Sure, some of them have obvious influences. But a catchy homage to a catchy song is still catchy, so what's the problem? And the first song of the special has some pretty big-name guest singers. This got the ball rolling for how impressive these specials could be, but even without that, it's still just a really great episode of Phineas and Ferb. And that's my ranking of all of Phineas and Ferb's extended-length adventures. At least so far, there is going to be another movie coming to Disney+, Plus, which I'm really excited about, although it's not like I really needed another reason to give this giant entertainment monopoly every last dollar I have. But until then, this is my ranking of these specials and movies, so what about you? Where do you rank each special and movie? Let's discuss this in the comments, and until next time, this is Dave, signing off. Special thanks to Chandler for not only prompting me to go ahead with this video, but for also appearing in this video. Check out his video about the Agent P World Showcase adventure at Epcot. An extraordinarily special thanks to Ryan Walterson for his very generous Patreon pledge. If you also want to help the channel, you can support me on Patreon and even get a sneak peek at next month's video right now.